Hello and welcome to NSE Futures Tech Summit 2014, an initiative taken by NSE whereby they are bringing in all the stakeholders together, creating a common platform so that they can deliberate and discuss the latest emerging technology trends. BFSI application needs a common functionality. Cloud computing gives you that access, that platform where one can use large-scale applications with less technical difficulties. Let's listen in to the experts. When we talk about cloud, we often think about technology. But cloud is not just about technology, it's also about a whole new different business model to deliver IT functionality to the world. In my opinion, there's only three things, three platforms in technology that change the business process radically. The first one is everything becoming digital. Things becoming smaller and smaller. Miniaturization on my phone is almost as powerful as a mainframe 10 years ago. Okay? So what we can do in a small device becomes a second big platform of transforming of the business process. And the third platform we believe is cloud, but combined with mobility, big data, and social network. So what does that mean for the financial industry if cloud is this third big platform of transformation? First of all, the reality is business people like the cloud business model. If businesses like it and they start consuming it, all they need is a credit card. Okay? So meaning it's easy to hide when you have cloud consumption that is not known to the whole organization. Third thing it means is applications will need to be rewritten. Final one is that the financial service providers like NSC um, and also what we call community clouds, which are gatherings of banks to do one particular financial service, are the ones who will adopt cloud first. And then we also believe that private clouds will be the more popular model um, and if there is public cloud consumption, initially, it will be within a country only because of the regulations of where data has to live. What are the benefits if business adopts it so rapidly? The biggest benefit is that cloud helps them to enable business innovation. Why is that? First of all, it lowers the cost of innovation. The speed by which you can do things is amazing. It will also lower your risk, lowers your access and knowledge gap, if we say, okay, cloud is a new uh, model for IT, what type of cloud? Private, public? The reality is it's going to be hybrid. But at the same time, we believe that most companies will build private clouds, also financial institutions, that they operate themselves. But the key is really to optimize across these two models. Uh, financial institutions need to rethink about their applications and their infrastructure to be more cloud ready. It's great to see that NSE is really leading here. Cloud is a real innovation enabler. There's a real value to the business. Cloud demands a new approach of how you run IT. The financial services industry is at a crossroads. Some analysts talk about being at the Rubicon. In other words, being at this crossroad of do I focus on uh, optimizing the IT investments that I've made already, or do I invest in new technologies? Do I look at cloud computing? Do I look at uh, software-defined networks? Do I look at big data and analytics? Now, at Cisco, we believe that you can do both. Save to invest is in terms of looking at data center, for example, data center technology, data center operations, moving away from being a cost center to being a service center in terms of invest to win, looking at IT as a service, maximizing the om omni-channel experience by using the right mix of technology, whether it's cloud, mobility, big data, video, which is okay, part of social, if you want, 
that interaction, that collaboration, and cloud is the platform to do that. Even though cloud computing is still nascent, all of the new investments are going towards cloud computing. Really looking at data governance and looking at all aspects of data in order to maximize the benefits of cloud computing by tiering data or classifying data and deciding where uh, certain data sets can be, whether on, they need to be on premise at one end of the classification to being anywhere in the cloud, anywhere in the world at the other end. Uh, financial institutions tend to be wary of keeping data outside off of premise. The classic contact center continues to play a major role in the financial services industry, but having virtual contact centers, contact centers based in cloud, allowing programs, uh, you know, marketing initiatives to be implemented quickly through these virtual contact centers. Using the data center, now most financial uh, and banking uh, customers that we have are implementing today private clouds. It makes sense, right? They want to keep things on premise, but they want to get the benefits of cloud. Now, as they're seeing the benefits of private clouds, they're looking at how can I start to move some workloads across to the public cloud, but do it in a secure fashion. We're seeing a lot of infrastructure commoditization to make cloud a reality. Does that mean hardware doesn't matter anymore? Well, far from it, right? Cisco, as a hardware vendor, continues to innovate in the compute space. Hybrid clouds are definitely the way of the future, marrying both public clouds and private clouds together and moving those workloads uh, securely. What does it really take for you to actually build an effective enterprise solution considering all the cloud offerings that indeed may be available to you? So, I mean, if you really look at all of the cloud computing solutions that are available, it is indeed an opportunity, but it is also a very significant challenge. There are five things that most banking and financial services organizations constantly want to do, right? Obviously, you want to eliminate the need for building upfront capacity. Uh, you want the ability to dynamically provision environments from weeks to hours to minutes. Uh, you want the ability to add new products and services very quickly and have the ability to expand into new countries, new geographies very, very quickly. Ideally, you want to have consumption-based IT spend. And last but not the least, have the ability to rapidly leverage emerging technologies. Cloud is certainly a one such enabler or technology that is to uh, our rescue. If you think about all the different types of cloud services that are available, you can actually classify them in, along these two dimensions. There is a services dimension that says you can what are you consuming as a service? You can consume infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, business process as a service. So there are many variants available on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, once again, you have multiple <coughs> variants available. You have the private version, you have the community version. So as an organization, as a bank or a financial services institution, you really have to figure out what are you going to use from this spectrum for what part of your estate and why. Regardless of where you decide to operate, one key thing that you have to actually become comfortable with is the fact that you will have to take technology and operations outside of your boundary. So as an IT organization, you start worrying about all these issues. I mean, what happens to my privacy and security? Or what happens to my compliance? What happens to my performance? The challenge really is figuring out what to do, when to do, why to do. And as we have heard again and again from everyone, hybrid cloud is the only logical solution. How do I actually build my hybrid cloud? If you really want to actually build a sophisticated solution, you have to both understand the supply and your demand, and then figure out how to match this, the supply and the demand effectively. What are the objectives as to why you are actually embarking on this cloud journey? Is it because of cost? Is it because of agility? Uh, uh, to perhaps expand into a new geography or a new market. Also, you have to understand what kind of workloads you're actually putting in the cloud. So basically, the choice of your cloud or cloud provider 
or cloud services that you integrate depends on the functionality, the characteristics, and at that point in time, whether it is differentiated or commodity. The world of data is growing exponentially. Taking an informed decision based on this data is getting tougher and tougher for organization. Experts say that data science is the solution for solving this problem. Let's listen. Visualization, if you think about interactive dashboarding, visualization, you kind of think about sort of um, buttons and uh, dials and things like that, but as the world evolves, we're finding more and more sophistication up through the executive channel. And I think one of the things we as data providers, uh, software providers, are doing is we're starting to undervalue the knowledge of uh, the executives and the people, and we give them dumbed down information. If you just think about dashboards or visualization or interactive data um, display without thinking about modernizing your platform you're probably going to be hard pressed to be successful so I do think that you're gonna to have to think about how you modernize your platform uh, as you move forward big data is any data that's uncomfortable for you to handle and I think that's kind of the idea is we're in a stage where the amount of data that we have is uncomfortable for many organizations to handle it. And that, that size of data is a problem from the ingestion of data, from bringing data into the system, through the learning of data, and through the display and uh, dissemination of data. If we think about visualization, if you think about how you're presenting data to people, you have to decide, am I representing something? Am I focusing or simplifying something? Am I helping with the understanding of it, or am I communicating? And to me, a good graph will do, in some ways, all of that. So what are some of the things that we look for in a visualization tool? You do want a central point of control, a central sort of metadata system where you can impose certain controls on it, security, uh, drill down hierarchies, those kinds of things. You do want a wide range of graph types. Uh, another thing is I like drill anywhere. No pre-computing in the system. Multiple uh, computation types. I do think you like interactions of multiple display types. So you want to have graphs that link together, that you can link, so that when you drill into one, others react to that. Obviously, you want filtering and sorting. And you want that to be both local and uh, globally. Highlight uh, subsets of data, of course, is, is the ability to um, drill into or look at data or exploit data that way. By creating these visualization tools that are hooked into a corporate data source, into a distributed data source, you control some of the information that gets, that gets displayed and, and uh, exchanged. And I think that's something we should be thinking about is not just the visualization tools themselves, but that data layer that goes under them and how do we disseminate that information. <music> Financial services for a long time now, and certainly today, is completely dependent on complex technology. You don't start with dashboards, you try to understand what the use and context are. And what we've developed over a number of years along with our customers is to try and build a model that enables you to determine what it is you're trying to achieve from the outset. And so we've prescribed a, effectively a five-level uh, means of monitoring. Level one being infrastructure monitoring, understanding the health and availability of uh, infrastructure like networks and service, up through the application, all the way up to the business flow itself. And really you can choose at what level you're trying to aspire to for a given piece of uh, technology stack. And it may be perfectly permissible to look at, say, a level three of monitoring is, is what you're setting out to try and achieve. Then you need to understand what the use case or it's going to be applied to, whether that's a technology user, a production management operations person, a service level person, or a, or a business user. And when understanding the combination of those things, you can then set out what you're going to design from a data model, what you need to collect, and then eventually how you're going to visualize it. It's absolutely critical that you have some kind of architectural model in place before you actually set, set out to uh, 
to figure out how you're going to end up getting to a point where you visualize information for people. The important thing here as well, uh, from my perspective, is bearing in mind you are collecting data that you're going to render in different ways for different people. That can often be the same data, but used for different purposes. So this, this first stage of mapping out what you're trying to achieve and who you're trying to achieve it for is fundamentally important. Interactive dashboards have to do two key things. Uh, they have to be informed by the level of maturity that you want to uh, achieve in terms of your overall monitoring of the technology stack or the business flow. And you need to understand exactly what you want to visualize for the type of user that is going to be using that, that visualization or that dashboard. So the positive things today are by using this kind of um, technology, people have achieved very, very significant improvements in terms of avoiding what I would call level one or severe outages. People can ach achieve very dramatic improvements um, in terms of uh, mean time to fix. You can spend ages looking around trying to understand what the root cause of a problem are, is, but by understanding the topology, to understand the dependencies and the upstream and the downstream, you can actually now get quite quickly to where the root cause of an issue is. Customer expectations are relentlessly rising uh, and it's important that we constantly adapt uh, and use our expertise and tools to meet these demands. Um, our key themes going forward will be simplicity, automation uh, and efficiency and really just getting the basics right. You know, if we don't do the basics right, all of the fancy stuff that we build on top of it um, is going to fail at some point. The final bit I'd like to kind of share with you is perhaps um, our most interesting development, and most exciting developments as well. And that's something that we're calling our global nerve center. Um, now, the concept behind this is to really kind of get our best infrastructure, application, um, operations, service management guys in the same room and give them the data and tools that they need to proactively manage our services, um, proactively and reactively as well. What we, we found at Standard Chartered, sometimes when we do have an incident, uh, we lose time in resolution trying to get the right people um, together, looking at the problem together. Um, you know, quite often people are looking at things in a siloed way which extends our resolution times. So our monitoring is going to be a real underpinning concept behind this. Risk management and compliance are key aspects of PFSI sector and it maintains the financial integrity of the space. Any failure to that can cause serious threat. Let's look at a control framework that helps you manage risk and sort of the control. Well, how do you manage this framework? It is around understanding your control environment, having defined that control environment, where are the risks, where are the failure points, what is in place. It is around setting up the monitoring, effective monitoring and supervision of those controls. The third element is around risk culture, and the fourth element is the board's responsibility. Right. If you start thinking along these four dimensions and you think these things through logically, you're in a good place where you've thought through your control environment. So now that I have a framework in place, now that I've thought through this, how do I leverage technology to set up that control environment? So the idea is to have a single tool that allows you to look across this universe of audit, compliance, ops risk, to look across the universe of policies, to look across the universes of processes and the controls and man monitor them. Is technology always the answer? The answer to that is not always, right? Technology is the enabler. I think there are a number of steps that the organization needs to sort of think about. Do you have a clear understanding of your risk control environment, right? 
Do you have that ownership and the right stakeholder management? Because this implies that there is increased visibility across the organization. Do you have clear delegation of responsibilities and roles? And the last is don't underestimate the time, effort, and energy required to implement some of these systems. So I'm just going to pose three questions at the very end for you folks to think. Does your organization have a systemic framework to identify your control environment risks? As senior leaders, how comfortable are you yeah. that you have a comprehensive view of risks? How do you make that risk reward trade off? areas basically to talk about. One is on cyber crime. RBI figures say that the crime reported to them has reduced by half from 15,000 a couple of years ago to around 8,000 or so. But more interestingly, the financial loss in these cases has doubled. So we have an environment where crime is growing. The cybercrime is growing in a significant way. Financial losses are becoming more and more. Second thing I wanted to spend a little time on was on a perspective on fraud. The big cheats, the ones who do insider trading or some big time financial frauds, all of them have started from some small activity. In my experience of the last 15 odd, 15, 20 years, even the big scams in the financial market, we had a look at you know, India's first financial scam, the Harshad Mehta scam. And when I could talk to him, it was very clear that it starts with something very small, some little regulatory loophole which is exploited once, repeated twice, repeated many times. And that is a slippery slope. If you can catch these violations at a very early stage, I mean, that is where our entire effort in compliance and risk is focused, then we do not have a problem on hand. But how do we catch these violations early? I think one of the ways to do that is to identify which are the points at which the organization is most concerned and have systems at those points which will have better supervision over activities at that point. Adapting to right technology, mitigating the risk that are posed by new technology, at the same time effectively handling big data by using the latest innovations and trend will clearly give your business a competitive edge. The future of the future's technology is here. Thank you for watching. It's surely very, very uh, informative, very, very uh, informative from the perspective of uh, cloud. First of all, I'll say thanks to NSC for initiating such initiative. As usual, they continue their trend of uh, keeping uh, a leadership role in uh, innovation. There are many questions to which you know we feel are being answered because there was interesting questions on Algo which was being raised and it was answered. Certainly this uh, initiative creates awareness.